So, I do work for biomedical research in the Max Delbrück Center for Molecular Medicine in Berlin. With this simplified view of a scientific project, I want to show you that we need the literature at each step. When we create the project, we need to, be, to know the state of the art, to have innovative ideas. When we do the experiments, we have to be up to date on the technology when we analyze also the new methods. It helps us to better explain the results, to make better hypotheses and perspective, and we can go on and on. And so this literature is obviously uh, essential. And this was the growth of this literature on, on the left hand side. Uh, within the years, and it grows very fast. And we have now in this so very essential database, it's called PubMed, where we find citation to the literature, only citation, not the full articles. We have now to deal with 20 million or more uh, citations, relevant documents that can help us to, to do the research. At the same time, this is just one example of a molecular database, um, a DNA sequence database, GeneBank. This is the growth of the content in nucleotide or base pairs. We are talking about billions of uh, nucleotides, 160 billion. And so we have to make sense of that using that, something like that. So it's impossible for one mind. We need the computers, of course. And we can have a closer look to the literature. This is the same curve for the literature. It just ended a bit earlier in 2008. So we have many citations, just citation or abstract, very short text, 200 words, 400 words. And so this is a total, eight, 18 million. And actually only about 10 million contain an abstract where we can really start to do text mining. And this is a number one data set for text mining in biomedical science. So it's absolute number one. And we have links to full text. So since we can click and go to the journal web page in many cases, in nine millions, but only 2.4 millions are freely accessible for everybody. And there is a very useful database which is called PubMed Central, contains free text from many different publishers. And it's a central place for a text miner to, to, to find the text. And it contains two millions, 1.8 million documents. And if I'm really a text miner, it's not that. It's that, the open access subset of this database. The rest is under copyright, so you can read it, you cannot mine it. But more research are done with this small set. This is still significant. It's 200,000 documents. And but you understand that up to now, we were all uh, working on, on this big set. And yeah, I will give you some examples of text mining. Uh. What we do, this will give you an overview. And if, if you go to this PubMed database, which is absolutely necessary, you, you try your first query, Alzheimer's disease, only let's say two keywords. You get many results. Last week it was 90,000 documents. And you realize quickly the difficulty is that you get many false positives, many uh, irrelevant documents. It, so in this view, red would be significant, blue are not significant. There are many significant ones, it's okay, but many non-significant. And, and for instance, so text mining can help the user, the researcher to to better retrieve the documents. And this is what I, I was doing with it's a text mining toolbox that gets a query and the, um, the literature. And you, you think differently. So you, you, with a query, you, you have a, a set of relevant documents where you can guess more systematically what would be the better keywords to, to search. 
this very nice uh, world cloud is exactly the concept. So Alzheimer's dementia, Tangle, SDA, I, I even don't know what are these terms, but they, they can be computed automatically. And the idea is to get the literature by relevance in C by default order, by date, that is also interesting. And, uh, and already um, another application of this uh, different way to search the, um, the documents is to look at the genes. So these are our chromosomes, genes can be identified in this. And with data <coughs> mining of the available database, you can attach for each gene a set of articles, a set of documents. And with this type of information retrieval method, you can point which documents are relevant to your topic. And from that, you, so you, you can say this one is maybe more important than this one, or of course this one. But you, you are dealing with 20, thousand human genes where you want to know which of them are related to your topic. And this can be done in some seconds, in 20 or 30 seconds. And this <coughs> it really helps. Hmm? <laughs> First you get what is known, but as you see, even if I remove this Alzheimer term, I would get kind of a good score for some of the articles. And you get also predictions. And this is uh, the idea you can really discover genes that are involved in the disease and not known now. Then an other application of text mining is to extract very particular uh, information from the text. And this is an example application called Reflect that helps also to, to deal with this huge literature that has each article uh, has a lot of links to the Bio, uh, biomedical database and so the tool automatically detects the gene names, the chemical names or other terms and allows you to have this pop up with extra information, extra link where you can really read, it's enriched way to read the articles. Hmm? And and you can see that sometimes a gene co-occurs with the chemical. Or with, and this is a co-occurrence analysis that you, you, you can start to do. And the idea is that, or was tested like that, you have A that co occur with B, so a gene and a disease are found in, in one article, and other genes. And independently, you have C that also co occur with B, so <coughs> The main question is, can we really, maybe it exists, this, this uh, term. And so this was, in, for instance, demonstrated in 2010. So two examples, you have a gene and a disease. And you take a, a timeline, you, you can cut, you can make experiments using time. And you, I mind only things uh, before 2007. And, and you find this example, many genes co-occur in abstract with these two concepts or a chemical and, and a disorder. And if you have a look to the literature after this point, you can really sometimes find a, a link, a real link. So this is information extraction. And it can be even more complicated, more powerful. It's called a semantic analysis where instead of only having a look to, to entities, you really make sense of the sentence. So ATA also mediates the phosphorylation of tumor suppressor P53. So let's say we have two genes, but we have something, an event, a relationship. And, and so there are algorithms to build this relationship. So positive regulation is caused by ATA to do phosphorylation of P53. P and and now you, the work is also to identify clearly this term in an existing database where things are well organized. And this is not easy, this, it looks like, but no. 
So we had 20, 40,000 genes. They have not only one name, they have several names. And they, so these synonyms, sometimes, two genes have the same synonym. So they share the same synonym. You don't know if it is gene A or B. Uh, in articles, they use the same term. And another example, you're interested in human, mouse, rat. So the homologen has the same name in the three species, often. So it makes things complicated, and it's not perfect. You, you don't have the text mining tool that gives you the perfect result. So it's, there is always limits uh, in this. But then you can do it systematically with a computer. And you take the whole available literature, this PubMed, the full articles, and you can, so this uh, view of this, make all this relationship and store in knowledge base or helps curator of biological database to, to build the content. And this database can be then the <coughs> reference, a real reference for biologists, a curated, well-known. And this approach can speed up the building of this knowledge base. And then you can use what is in this. And, and now we, you have more than a co-occurrence, you, you have a, an event, so activation, inhibition, binding of all these guys, of proteins, metabolites, and it's a network of, of things. They are linked. And if you are interested, in, like in these authors, in plant defense response, you can start to model the response at the molecular level. And manually, you build this thing, so the blue things would be proteins or metabolites, and the links like here are events or relationships. And you need, you need that if you want to work, to understand, to, to make an experiment, removing this node, seeing what happens, whatever. But if you use a systematic text mining, this in green are the additional links you, you get. Because there is a limit of what you can do manually. At some point you stop, you, you, you work. And with the text mining, you can really enrich your model, but it makes the story very different. It's not the same at this point. So I'm changing a bit the topic. This is also uh, about the time you can follow the trends in the literature. <laughs> and just some examples, thyroid disease and flu, and you can something happen here and whatever the researchers started to, to work on it. So you, there, are, there are many tools in text mining, so just giving some examples, but the time is, is interesting. Also, considering the electronic patient records in hospitals, so in Rennes, France, they were interested in detecting surgical site infections. And you can use past reports from 2008 to build this kind of model with the words. Now you take the present report and you try to classify them automatically. And this, this is uh, the results. So this one is a manual. So it's weekly the, the partition, they review the case <coughs> and they can point of some. So they detect three and they miss 10. But three, they never say this one is an infection and it's not. So no false positive. So I skip this one, I have not much time. And you, you take the full text uh, mining of these medical reports, records. You raise 12 true cases out of 13. You miss only one. At the expense of you raise 18 false alarms. So but comparing to another method, it's not, it's, it's quite uh, okay. I mean, it's, uh, you can uh, handle it. Um, again, with the electronic patient records, you can, you can try to enrich. So th there are some international classification of disease that is used in hospital for billing and social purpose. And they annotate the patient record to 
to identify the main purpose of the hospitalization. <coughs> and with Segmani, you can, mining the free text part of this record, you can find more of these codes. And, and then you can compare, it's a heat map, each row is a disease, each row is a disease, the similarity of this, if they share the same uh, profile over the patients. And you can find many obvious relationships between disease, all the mental disorders, they have similarities, so it's fine. All the things like that, but if you don't find it, it doesn't work at all, your method. Hmm? But you find also unexpected similarity between disease. And then you can go back to some other data, the protein-protein interaction, and have some, this is known from the literature, and you can make some hypotheses. Maybe there is a link. This gene is involved in this disease, this one in this one, and they are linked with a very short path in this full network. And the last example, <coughs> so you use kind of the same, but you take the drug labels, the package inserts, where you find side effects. And by text mining, you can code these side effects in a very efficient way, a comparable way. So each drug has a different list of side effects. And then you can compare the drug. Do they have the same type of side effect? And you say if they share the same side effects, they may target the same protein. And this is the interest here. Normally, you, you, you compare the structure and say, ah, they have a similar structure. And they should share a target protein. And you, you, you put all this stuff together. So you have each circle is a, pro, uh, a drug. And the link, if you predict uh, that they share a protein target. And so the author, they were focusing on this part. And you see this drug is predicted to share targets with others. But they are from different therapeutical uh, indication. This is for alimentary and this is for neuro. <coughs> and they can validate the green row were validated, the other they existed from drugs to <coughs> proteins. And this is just a systematic and comprehensive way to repurpose marketed, target, uh, marketed drugs. So you don't, you avoid this very expensive procedure to bring a drug on the market. So in summary, we need computers for dealing with the data, of course, store, analyze. The literature, we need it all the time. Text mining has very broad and different applications, but we are limited by the availability of the text. So I, I will maybe skip this one it's some technical problems. Often the full text come in PDF, but the computer don't know where to start that one. Mm -hmm. and, and the methods up to where were optimized for the abstract and not for the full text, so people have to, to adapt. I, I would say in conclusion that scientists need to know better the, what is copyright. <laughs> I have seen many people, they just take everything, they work on it, and maybe it's illegal, actually. So. Um, it could help if <laughs> could help if we have a unified license. I don't know something simple. Hmm? Uh, of course, we need the full text. We need to copy it at least one time to work on it. A structured way, something like XML, not PDF. The figures would be optional, optional. And if I want only the full text and I compress it, I provide it to someone. One article is 13 kilobytes. Okay. This is uh, what we are asking for. If you would have one million, it's 12 gigabytes, a SD card. Or if any single publisher would have 20 million, it would be uh, a smaller drive. Then I would prefer everything open access. The text has text <laughs> and the data. Oh, oh, another way, uh, maybe it should be more than only text but the way to standardize what is in the, in the documents. A list of facts using following standard. And also we miss all information from the figures and from the table. It's impossible to pass that. So maybe we can just code them 
in some way, that's it. And we will have a very better uh, data. Thank you. Are there any questions for Jean Fred? No questions? Ah. Um, we've spoken about this, uh, Jean Fred, but um, you've clearly made you've made it clear that text and data mining for your discipline holds huge potential. Um, why do you think that researchers within your dis discipline aren't abs absolutely clamouring uh, for text and data mining to be able to do it for things to be easier? Why, why don't why aren't they all text and data mining? Why they don't why use they it? Are protesting more. Ah. <laughs> I mean, at some point, it's transparent what is text mining. You use the search engine, you don't know what's behind. Yeah? So, and <coughs> we do protest, but w it's there is a way to work with what is available. So we just work with. Depends who you are, but as we have project with defining a certain period of time, we, we don't go for long procedures. We, we just do it or we find an alternative. So I would say maybe researchers try to find always alternatives. <laughs> yeah. And, but we, we do need, and many scientists are interested in text mining, even if they don't do it themselves, but it can really bring. The first question is all scientists in the biometric. I produce 1,000 new protein interactions. Is one known somewhere? That is the first question. It's everywhere. Is your known data? What, what does it mean? It validates your new technology. You need it. <laughs> and if, it's not, if you don't know it anywhere, it may be a very good candidate to, to, to dig into, to, to find more. Okay, any more questions? David. Yes. Um, as far as the impact of the restriction, the lack of more text and data mining, um, do you feel that this means there's more duplication of research, research that might not need to be done? One question. The other question, do you think there's not there often on certain subjects, because <coughs> of the lack of text and data mining, there is not enough critical mass of people seeing research, for example, to, to show that something is wrong? I mean, what I'm saying is, is this a barrier to excellence in research? I think so, yeah. So research is duplicated, for sure. Myself, I cannot access all the text mining literature from my institute uh, <coughs> access. It's a biomedical institute, and they don't cover all computer science literature. Oh. So I, I could work on something that exists. It, sometimes it's good. It's, it's science. Science needs to validate, duplicate things. But you have to know it, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and what, what, what was your second uh, question? Hmm. Well, basically, um, it's science a barrier. needs to have, what is it called? I think it's in English, false, false syn We need a critical mass to basically to prove the hypothesis, to prove it wrong. And often, if sci it's uh, not enough dissemination. Um, yeah, there's so there's this. Not a, there's not enough critical scientific mass to check the hypothesis. Yes, of course, but not all hypotheses are yeah. uh, validated or checked uh, all the time. Uh, so there, there is kind of imbalance. One result can be very strong, another doubtful. If you don't know about so, it. Um, yeah. And so I, I'm not sure if it is uh, in this way a uh, limit. 